All right, this is my second of two videos on the Pentax K1000. In the first video, we talked about what everything on the camera is. In this video, we're gonna talk about how to use all of the things on your camera. First up, what we're gonna do, this camera is completely mechanical in terms of its ability to take a photo. So you only need a battery to charge, or to power rather, the light meter. But we're gonna start off by changing the battery on this camera. So to change the battery, Here's the battery chamber. This is a US nickel, this works really well. Other countries will have different coins that work really well. You just unscrew the battery cap from the chamber. Now, if you have a made in China version of the K1000, this is a bayonet. You only have to turn it about a half or a quarter turn to get it to come out, and then you can release it. This is not cooperating. This is, by the way, a lot easier to do when the camera is upside down because gravity works with you or on its back works even better. Okay, so here's the battery cap. All right, so there's the battery cap. Here is a 357 style, a size battery. So the, the K1000 takes a single 357, which is also called AG13 LR44 A or S76 battery. The side with the text is your positive terminal, and it just fits right into your battery cap like that. So when you hold your battery cap, then you should see a side with no text. That is the negative terminal. A note on batteries, I strongly recommend getting a name brand like a Duracell, Energizer, or so forth battery because the um, fly-by-night brands that are available on everybody's favorite online mega retailer, uh, I've had some trouble with those leaking and exploding after just a few months or less, in a couple of cases, a few weeks, inside of cameras. A leaked or exploded battery is not, it, it's repairable, but if you have to send it off for a professional repair, that's more expensive than decades worth of good batteries. So just buy a good brand name, established brand name battery for your camera and you won't regret it. All right, so back down here now at the battery chamber, you can see this is what a clean battery chamber looks like. There's a contact in there, and the way that the battery chamber works is that little straight contact, and then the outside of the battery, it's of the camera housing itself, uh, complete the circuit that make the uh, that allow the battery or the light meter rather to work. Okay, so we're going to put the battery back into the camera. That's the way it should look when it's loaded correctly. Then we drop the battery cap on top. And I usually reverse thread it a little bit just to get the thread seated well in the raceway. And then we can screw it in. Now this should thread and screw in very easily. If it's putting up resistance, back it out and try to get the threads reseated. I'm not hamming this up, I'm just really bad at this. Um, you'd think, I've had one of these for 35, 30 years now. I should know how to do this better. Anyway, um, there we go. The threads should catch e easily and thread in. If they put up resistance, if they aren't seating well, back it out, try to get them reseated. You don't wanna cross thread your battery cap because that can be a complete pain in the rear and can damage your camera. Okay, with the battery cap, in, with the battery installed, now the light meter has power and the light meter is going to work. What does the actual light meter look like? Well, back in the day when I used to make these, I'd actually hold the camera up to, let's do this so you can, looks the correct way for you. I'd actually hold the camera up to the, um, the, the that I was reviewing up to the my camera, but that doesn't work so well anymore with the new setup I have. So I've printed out a mock-up of what you will see inside of the viewfinder, okay? Some of you will just have a micro prism here. Some of you will have a split prism in the center. But for what we're gonna talk about with the light meter, this is what matters, okay? So you'll, this is your focusing screen and you'll see your scene in this area. And then as you adjust your aperture and shutter speed, your aperture being this on the ring right here and your shutter speed being this dial right here, this needle is going to move up and down. As you change lighting conditions, this needle's going to move up and down. So if you're sitting, let's say in a room right now, 
take your camera, make sure it's got a good battery in it, point it at the wall, and then point it at a lamp. And you'll notice that meter needle should change. If you want to check your meter for accuracy, set it to ISO 400, 1 60th of a second, and F5.6, and point your camera at a well-lit interior wall that's painted white or a very light off-white, and that needle should be somewhere in the middle, right around in here, okay? So if your needle is perfectly flat like this, it means one of two things. You don't have a battery or you have a perfect exposure, okay? If you move your camera around and the needle doesn't move, then you don't have a battery or there is some other issue going on like dirt in the battery chamber or a, an issue with the battery connection or an issue with the galvanometer in the light meter, okay? So your, your needle should, should change anytime you adjust the aperture or shutter speed or film speed dial and anytime you adjust lighting. Up here, that's an overexposure. So if your meter, meter needle moves up too much light, your image is going to be very blown out and bright. This is your, a minus sign down here. If your meter needle moves down, it's going to be very dark. You're going to have very little image detail. Everything's going to be black. So if you're anywhere within this range, you're going to be just fine for sure. Okay, This is a fairly narrow range. This represents around about a half stop, give or take, in each direction half stop being the difference be, being the difference between say f2 and f2.5 uh, 2.4 one of those two i forget which anyway so not much difference if you're down here or up here that's about a stop about two about three okay so the further that your needle gets from center the more underexposed or the more overexposed your image is going to be so you can do that for intentional creative intent if you would like to have a high key or a low key image. But if you're going for things that are mid key and properly exposed, as long as your needle is in this gap here, you're gonna be in really good shape for having a proper exposure, okay? Because, so now that we have put a battery in the camera, we've seen how to read the me meter, let's talk about how to change lenses because one of the great things about having an interchangeable lens camera is that you can change lenses and get different types of images or different looks from on the same roll of film. Changing the lens on this camera is really easy. This is the lens release button here. Simply push it to, toward the camera's body, grab the lens and rotate it counter or anti-clockwise about a quarter turn and now you can release the lens. To mount the lens you just do the opposite. What you're going to do is you're going to find this orange dot here and this orange dot on your lens. You're going to line those up and then you're going to turn this clockwise until the lens clicks in place and now you know that it's seated. I'm going to show you one other trick you can do with Pentax cameras and Pentax lenses. You might notice that there's this little white dot on the side of your lens. It's kind of hard sometimes to see those two orange dots to line them up. But if you line up that white dot or some lenses screen with your film re, uh, with your lens release button, that's proper lens alignment. And you can then do that just by feeling with your finger these two items to make sure they're aligned. And you don't even have to look at your camera to properly mount a lens. So now that we've seen how to do some basic operation, let's talk about loading and unloading film from the camera. To open the film back, which we're gonna to have to do to load or unload film, we lift up the film rewind knob, and now we can get into the back of the camera. Inside the back of the camera, we're going to take our roll of 35 millimeter film, we're gonna pull out a little bit of a leader and drop it into the film cassette chamber and push the film rewind knob and post back into place. That way the film won't come out going to draw out the leader a bit and we're going to feed it into this little slit here. It should grasp pretty easily but if you want you can put your finger over the sprocket hole here where the sprockets meet the, um, the teeth on this gear and hold it as you advance the camera and that will help make sure that the teeth engage the film and that it's pulled out uh, e evenly. Now, as we saw in the first video when we opened the back of the camera, I was talking about the film guide rails. Here you can see them doing their job. The outer rails keep the film from moving up and down, and the inner rails you can see through the sprocket holes. When the film back closes, now the pressure plate is going to sandwich those, just like that. 
Next, what we're going to do is we're going to go over here. We're going to make sure that the ASA is set to our film's ISO. Now, remember, ISO and ASA are the same. This is currently set to 400, but let's assume that we're actually using 100 ISO film. We're just going to lift up on the shutter speed dial setting ring, and now we can adjust the film speed to whatever we need to have the actual ISO be. And now, with it down, we can adjust the shutter speed. Okay, We're going to advance the shutter three times. I want you to watch this as I advance it the next time. You can see here that this is spinning. If this is spinning, then that means that your film is advancing. If it isn't, try taking some, some slack out of the film by turning this in the direction of the arrow. Don't crank it because you don't want to damage your film or your camera, but just take some of the slack out and then it should spin. Okay. Now we've done that three times. We are now at frame number one and we're ready to go. The reason that we do that is, I'll show you here inside the camera. Don't, don't do what I'm about to do. I'm doing this for illustrative purposes. As you can see, this film looks different, right? We have different film now. You can see because there's a smiley face that I drew on here um, in the camera. As we advance the film, it's being taken up through the camera. I'll show you what that looks like. Remember, film is one and done. So if you open your film's back, or your camera's back rather, while the film is in here like this, you're going to erase all of the images on the film that are past the front of the cassette here. So don't do that. Film can, ex can record light in exactly one time, and it's either with a, in a controlled manner with an accurate shutter speed and aperture, or an uncontrolled manner like this where every photon reaches it and it's ruined. But you can see here, how it is that the film's moving through the camera. And you can see as I do this, that the film rewind knob is also spinning because there's a direct mechanical connection between the film take up spool and the film that's inside of the cassette. Okay, so that's how the film moves through the camera. So you're going through your day and you're taking photo after photo, just like that, and you reach the end of your roll. Now it's time to rewind your film. You're going to push the film rewind button in and now you can just rewind it like this on some k1000s like for instance the one that, that i had that was stolen i had to hold the film rewind button down i don't know if that was a change in design or if that those few just have some sort of thing that doesn't work correctly but if if you have to hold it down you may need to do that you might have just heard a sound that was the film here coming off of the take up spool and when you get to the end and you've completely rewound the film, this should feel a little bit easier to turn. So now we're going to open up the back of the camera and we can take the film out. Maybe. Come on. Okay, there we go. So you just lift, the, <laughs> the way you do that is you lift this up and, and just drop the film cassette into your hand, by the way. Okay, so then if you rewind this the entire way, you'll be reminded that this has already been exposed and it's ready to go off to the lab to be developed. So you can leave a leader. If you develop yourself, you can leave a little bit of a leader here and then just write something like used or make a mark on it to remind yourself not to shoot it again so you don't get a bunch of accidental double exposures. But um, it, if you send them off to a lab, it's always a good idea just to pull it all the way into the film cassette to prevent the, um, the film from being accidentally double exposed. Okay, so let's get out here a little bit and you can now see this camera mounted on top of this flash because the next thing we're gonna talk about is how to use a flash with this camera. First thing is, this is a standard Xenon Sync or X-Sync flash. Most, as I said or in the first video, most flashes are like this and will work perfectly with your camera as long as you are set to 1 60th of a second or slower. We'll get to that in a second. So some tips here for using a flash to have your flash images turn out the best that they can. What you're seeing right now is the worst possible alignment for a flash. When you have a flash that's just above your lens, pointing at your subject, the light leaves the flash, reaches your subject, bounces back to your lens, and imagine like a wall of light doing that. It makes your subjects look flat and waxy, and it's not a flattering look for anyone. Think about how we see the world when we're outside, underneath the sun, or at night underneath streetlights, or indoors, underneath 
overhead lighting. And all of the light that we see shining on our world is from above, mostly. And when we see something lit from above, that is what our brains perceive as being normal and flattering. So if you want to set your subjects up to look good when you photograph them, get a lens, a flash rather, that does this so that you can bounce the light off of a ceiling. This will allow you to create a light that mimics what we're used to seeing with light leaving the lens, reaching the ceiling, bouncing back to your subject and then back to the lens and creating a more flattering appearance for your subject. Okay. But what if you're outside, then there's nothing, no ceiling to bounce it off of. Ideally, if you're gonna buy a flash, you'd get one that can, can tilt like this, but can also articulate. So if you have your flash on your camera, you can rotate the flash head like this, bounce it off of a wall or a reflector or something like that. And then you can have lighting that's also still pretty flattering to your subject. Okay, that's all well and good, but what if your hot shoe dies? That does happen with these cameras. In fact, my K1000 had a dead hot shoe for most of the time I, I owned it. You can, or what if you want to use two flashes? You could also connect a flash to the PC port via a cable that would connect. This, this flash doesn't have a cable connection, but some flashes do. Or you can get hot shoe connectors that have a cable and connect it that way. And then you can use a flash either uh, handheld off camera or as part of like a strobe setup. There's another thing you can do with a camera flash that's connected via a cable like this. You can get something called a flash bar, and I don't have one. Oh, I do have one readily accessible. So this is a flash bar right here. And as you can see, it's got two quarter 20 screws on it. And one of them screws into your camera's tripod socket, and the other one screws into an adapter right here that you can then put your flash on. So now, if you imagine that you have your camera set up like this, even if your flash is fixed in this position, like it doesn't articulate or tilt, you could shoot in portrait orientation and bounce your light off of the ceiling. Or you could shoot in landscape orientation and bounce your light off of the wall. So a flash bar like this is, if you already have a perfectly good flash, a really good way to give you some more flexibility with how you use your flash just by putting it off to the side of your camera. All right, so this is all well and good, but I've, I've done a lot of saying, here's how you should do things, not why. So let's talk about the way that a flash sync works on this camera. You can see I'm set to 1 60th of a second. Anything faster than 1 60th of a second in your flash will not work properly. A flash, a, a shutter like this camera has, which is called a focal plane shutter, works because one curtain opens and then a set, the second curtain follows it. And then when you advance the film, they reset, okay? First curtain opens, second curtain follows, advance, reset, right? So if you're at 1 60th of a second, that first curtain opens, and then the entire film area is exposed to light for roughly a 60th of a second, and then the second curtain closes and you advance the film. Well, if you're at, and, and if you do that, you take a 1 60th of a second exposure, you fire the flash, or the camera fires the flash more precisely, then all of the film will receive the light that bounces back to the camera from that flash, okay? So what if you're at 1 500th of a second? That first, cam that first curtain opens, and then the second one follows just like this, and then they reset when you advance the film. So let's say you use the flash. It's gonna trigger probably right about now, okay, right before the second curtain closes, or it might trigger right when the first curtain finishes its travel. I don't recall which with this camera. But what's gonna happen is that you're, at some point, your flash is gonna fire. You'll have this little strip of illuminated image and everything else that's blocked by the shutter will be dark, okay? So you won't have an image that's fully illuminated. What if you have a, a half second exposure? Well, the first curtain opens, your entire film plane is open, exposed to light for a half a second, and then the second curtain closes. So at 1 60th of a second, that's the fastest shutter speed at which the entire area of film is exposed to light at the same time. Anything slower 
and the entire area of film is exposed to light just for a longer period of time. So a flash will work with any shutter speed slower than 1 60th of a second. It just won't work with anything faster. All right, so what are some good creative uses of that? Well, let's say, for instance, that you wanted to do a bulb exposure of 10 seconds. You could hold your flash in your hand and trigger it at any point, whenever you're comfortable doing that. And so uh, the bulb is a very useful a way to control your light. If you had somebody walking through a scene with lights on, you could leave the shutter open in bulb, record the lights as they walk, trigger the flash at the exact moment that you right, trigger the flash and let go of the, the shutter button, and then you'll have your friend illuminated with like a stream of light coming off of them, for instance, as an idea of something you could do with that. So anything longer than a 60th flash will work, anything shorter it won't because of the way the shutter is designed. All right, so guess what? We have really gone through all of the operation. We've talked about how to use the shutter, how to adjust the shutter speeds, how to load, rewind film, use a flash, change lenses and all that. We've even talked about what the light meter tells you. But what we haven't done is gone through and talked about how to actually take a photo. So let's do that. You've got a lens on your camera. Lens cap is removed. You've got your battery in your camera as well. You've you look through the viewfinder right here, okay? Make sure that the shutter is ready to go. And look through the viewfinder. The, ne the needle is way up at the top. So we're going to bring the needle back down by adjusting the shutter speed and adjusting the aperture. There we go. Now we are have a, a proper me meter reading. The needle's very close to being in the middle. Take a photo. That's, well, oh, we forgot something. Shoot, you know what we forgot to do? We forgot to focus. So once you have a proper meter reading, then you're going to focus your, your image so that your subject is in focus, compose exactly how you want your image to look, and then take a photo just like that. Now a quick note while we're talking about this, if you have a lens that has this green A on it, that does nothing whatsoever with this camera, so don't use the green A. Okay, Don't, don't use that. It's not going to give you an accurate reading for your meter. Use any of the numbers that are not the green A when you adjust your aperture. Okay, so the green A will work with a Pentax DSLR or, or film camera from the mid to late 90s. This one is from the mid to late 90s, but never mind. If your camera has electronic contacts, the A will work, this camera does not. Okay, anyway, so that's how you take a photo. You just adjust your shutter speed and your, um, your aperture until you have a proper meter reading. Focus your image on what you want to have be in focus. And then when you're ready and you have your image composed, push the shutter button. But what about double exposures? First, we're going to talk about the mechanics of the double exposure, and then we'll talk about the science of the double exposure. So basically, with this camera can do double exposures. What you want to do is you want to first take all the slack out of your film. Okay, You want to make sure that the slack is out of it so that you don't accidentally shift the frame around when we're doing this next procedure. You're going to set up your, your scene and you're going to dial in the settings we'll talk about in just a moment. Take your first exposure. You're going to hold the film knob, which I find is easiest when the film lever is between my fingers. Push the film rewind button down and hold it and advance the film as you le advance lever as you do that. So you have three things you're doing at once. You're advancing the film advance lever, you're holding the film rewind button, and you're holding the film rewind knob. This keeps the film from advancing. This disengages the advanced gearing so that you don't ruin your camera or your film. And then this action advances, rearms the shutter without advancing the film because you're holding the rewind knob and the rewind button down while you do that. Okay, And then you take your second photo and then you take a photo, you advance it. Next thing you need to do is you need to make sure that you, you take a dead frame. Now, after that happens, you've disengaged the gearing by holding down the film rewind button. The gearing doesn't just instantly uh, re-engage. So you're only going to get a partial frame advance when you advance after your double exposure. So what you want to do is set this the shutter speed to a thousandth of a second, put your lens cap on, set this to f16 or 22, and then you take another photo and advance the film. That dead frame 
Yes, it wastes half a frame, but it prevents your next shot from overlapping your double exposure because your double exposure won't advance the entire way. Your next frame would partially overlap it. That dead frame advances the double exposure the whole way so that your next frame can be recorded on the film properly without ruining the double exposure that you just went to the trouble of creating. Okay, so understanding the physical process of how to use your camera for double exposure, let's talk about the scientific process behind it, okay? So let's say you've taken your meter reading and 1 1 25th of a second in f5.6 is a proper exposure. Film is designed to receive a certain number of photons for a proper exposure. So if we did a double exposure at these settings, your film would receive twice as much light as it should, which would result in an, a negative that's called dense, dark, or thick. Three words that mean the exact same thing, too many photons on the film, and the result of that is that your image will take longer to digitize, longer to print in the darkroom, and that in both cases it will have increased grain and reduced contrast things that we really want to avoid. So if we're going to do a double exposure, we want to, and we're going to do two photos, we want to cut the amount of film light that reaches the film in half. So if we're at 1 1 25th and f5.6, we have two ways of doing that. The first way is to adjust the shutter speed. And it's very easy to cut the light in half by just going to 1 2 50th. These are all fractional seconds, so the higher the number, the less time. 1 2 50th of a second is half as long as 1 1 25th. So we could do that, or if we were, we really, really want to have a 1 1 25th of a second exposure. So what we can do is we can use the aperture, and we can do, go from f5.6 to, to f8. Each one of these marked numbers cuts the amount of light in half, in the same way that each one of these marked numbers cuts the light in half. F8 is half as much light as F5.6. F5.6 is twice as much light as F8. Okay. So basically, if you're going to do a double exposure, you would want to cut the amount of light that's reaching your film in half, take your first shot, hold the things down, advance, set up your second shot, take it, advance, F22, lens cap, 1 1,000th, dead frame, and that's the process of taking a double exposure. And now doing that, you can do all kinds of creative things. Double exposures don't have to be taken at the same time. Do you want to take one in the daylight of a building, keep your camera set there until nightfall and have it show, uh, show up like the lights are illuminated during the day? Or maybe it's sunset and after dark to make the building's photo more dramatic. If you want to take a photo inside and outside, you can do that. All you have to do when you take your first and your second shot is adjust the amount of light reaching your film by half to allow the proper exposure. So you can do those two different shots at any different time and in multiple different settings. And that is really everything there is to know about how to use the Pentax K1000, one of the most underrated and capable cameras because it, it does only what you need it to do, and anything your creative vision can bring to a photo within the technical limitations of this camera, it can do it.